for God's Word. Almighty God, as we gather in your house to hear your word, I pray that your Holy Spirit would come among us, that you would help us to hear from you uh, that which we need to hear, that which you want to teach us, that which you want us to walk away with. In your name we pray. Amen. I want to begin with a quick summary of an article that David Brooks wrote for the New York Times back in October called The Rising Tide of Global Sadness. It's a summary. Taylor Swift was quite the romantic when she burst on the scene in 2006. She sang about the ecstasies of young love and the heartbreak of it. But her mood has hardened as her star has risen. Her new album, Midnight's, plays upon a string of negative emotions, anxiety, restlessness, exhaustion, and anger. Turns out Swift is part of a larger trend. Researchers analyzed more than 150,000 pop songs released between 1965 and 2015. Over that time, the appearance of the word love in top 100 hits was cut in roughly about half. Meanwhile, the number of times such songs contain negative emotional words like hate rose sharply. Pop music isn't the only thing that's gotten a lot harsher. Other researchers analyzed 23 million headlines published between 2000 and 2019 in the United States. The headlines, too, grew significantly more negative, with a greater proportion of headlines denoting anger, fear, disgust, and sadness. If misery levels keep rising, what can we expect in the future? According to the Global Peace Index, civic discontent, riots, strikes, anti-government demonstrations increased by 244 percent between 2011 and 2019. The emotional health of our world is shattering. Now that's David Brooks' word, but I, it's not too far off the mark to say that, I believe. Why? Why is this happening? What on earth is going on in our world? Well, today the world is trying to get people to believe in a worldview that is clearly contrary to God's plan and to what he says is right and wrong. The world, our flesh, the devil, they're all trying to tell us that the individual comes first. And that what each person believes about life And what each person wants to do with their life is right for them. Now that's a very brief summary. There's far more to it than that. But, you know, it's this same old humanistic philosophy that's been around for thousands of years. It keeps popping up throughout our history if you study history. I'm going to read quickly from 1 Peter that's not it. There it is. 1 Peter chapter 4, beginning at verse 1. Therefore, since Christ suffered in his body, arm yourselves also with the same attitude, because he who has suffered in his body is done with sin. As a result, he does not live the rest of his earthly life for evil human desires, but rather for the will of God. For you have spent enough time in the past doing what pagans choose to do, living in debauchery, lust, drunkenness, orgies, carousing, and detestable idolatry. They think it's strange that you do not plunge with them into the same flood of dissipation 
and they heap abuse upon you. Does that sound familiar? If you stand up and say that you believe certain things, there's a really good chance you're going to get yelled at today. And when we live by our own rules and we put humans first, we do not wind up with a utopian society, which the world has been striving for for thousands of years. And they keep coming up with ideas to make and create this utopian society, and it's never happened. So, what is God's plan? And what does he say is right and wrong? And can that make any bit of difference in what's going on in the world? Before I jump into that question and answer it briefly, you need to know it's coming from this book. It's God's word. I believe it's true. And as I told my confirmation class this morning... One of the ways you can believe that it's true is by looking at, for instance, the Gospel of Mark. He was not one of the original apostles, but he wrote one of our Gospels. Now, if he had written that Gospel and then sent it around for people to read, some of the churches and people and whatnot, and he had written something in there that wasn't right, the other apostles who had spent three years with Jesus learning from him and listening to him would have pointed to that and said, wait a minute, Mark, this isn't right right here. You need to redo that. They were there to make sure that what was written is correct. And so the Gospels we have, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you can count that the stories about Jesus are true and the teachings that he gave us are true. Now what about Paul's letters? He wrote a ton of letters Paul originally hated the church. He wanted all Christians to go to jail and ultimately be executed. But Jesus had another plan. He got a hold of his heart and Paul started writing these letters of teaching to the church. Well, how do we know those are true? Well, the same criteria applies. The apostles would have read his letters and said, wait a minute, Paul, that's not right and made him fix it, write a new letter. Unfortunately, they didn't have computers back then to just cut and paste and delete and retype and all that. He would have had to get his scribe and start over or scratch it out or whatever. But that's how we know and can trust that the Bible is true. That's just one example. So, real quick summary of what God's plan for the world and humanity is and why and what he says is right and wrong. Creation, the fall, the law, and redemption. Now I could do a whole sermon series on it, but I'll be brief. Number one, creation. Read Genesis chapter one. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. I believe that's true. I believe that evolution is not true. I don't believe God used evolution to create the world. I believe God is all-powerful, and if he said planets come into being, he could speak it, and it would happen. God is all-powerful. That's what I believe. And then he created male and female. And that was his plan. Secondly, the fall, he gave Adam and Eve one rule. Don't eat from this tree, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And he spelled it out for them. One tree. The tree of life they could eat from. And live forever. So what did they do? They ate from the one tree they weren't supposed to. They had all these, these great trees and, and all the food you could want just growing right there. Oh, I like that one over there instead. It's called the fall. It's called sin. It's called willful disobedience doing what you want to do yourself instead of what God tells us is right and wrong. It brought sin into the world and into our lives. And then third, the law. So he gave us one rule and then 
uh, we couldn't keep that one, so he gave us ten. <laughs> How do you think we're doing with those? <laughs> Not so good. <laughs> but he gave them to us. He said, this is what's right and this is what's wrong. And then throughout the Bible, there are other places that reveal to us other things that are, God says is right and wrong. And that's why I say read it. Read, read the book. It tells us what's right and wrong. And then finally, redemption number four. This is the best part. So the fall, he tells us what's right and wrong. We can't keep it. Sin is part of our lives. And so he sends Jesus, who died on the cross and rose again, that our sins would be nailed to the cross, that he would defeat death, and that we could have life now and eternally. That's redemption. We just stated it in the Nicene Creed. We say it every Sunday. It's also in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 1 through 6. I won't read that, but it's one of my favorite passages. And it talks about his resurrection. And he mentions 500 people that saw him. I love that passage. I imagine these 500 people were gathered together to worship and also to listen to teaching. There were probably inquirers, people who were curious about this whole Christian thing. And they gathered together as a group, and then Jesus showed up. I wish I'd have been there. Why didn't they record it? Come on, we got camcorders. <laughs> but we do have a recording of it. Paul wrote it in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Jesus showed up to 500 people. So, in a nutshell, that's God's plan. That's how we know what is right and what is wrong. And when we study history, what we see is when people follow God's plan for the world in humanity, and when people put their faith and trust in Jesus and are filled with the Spirit, then people are at peace with God. People are at peace with themselves. And people are at peace with everyone around them. Let us pray. Almighty God, we give you thanks and praise for your word which calls us to love you and to believe in you and to follow you. But Lord, you know it's hard for us. So Father, so fill us with your Holy Spirit that we are given the strength and the courage and the fortitude to walk with you every day. In your name we pray. Amen.